Hello and welcome to this installment of the International Postdoc Forum for the Philosophy of Science hosted by the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science. My name is Alan Love. I am the director of the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science and uh, just want to say uh, very quickly a few notes about this event, uh, which was uh, begun unsurprisingly uh, during the pandemic when we were doing things so often virtually uh, if not exclusively, um, and we were looking for ways to recover lost conference and workshop opportunities, and in particular, uh, those who were on their up-and-coming career trajectories at the postdoctoral level. Uh, as we continued the program and uh, the pandemic backed off, there was such enthusiasm for it, we decided to continue this and showcase virtual uh, presentations from international scholars with commentaries from our local community here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Helena Scott Fordsman, coming to us uh, from the University of Cambridge in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science. Uh, the title of her presentation is Ethnographic Philosophy articulating embodied ideas in science. And I just wanna make a quick note about procedure for those who might be joining us for the first time. Helena will give her presentation that will be followed by a short commentary from Karen Sukause, um, who I will introduce at that point. Um, and then after that, Helena will have a brief opportunity to respond to the comments before we open it up for general uh, Q&A. At that time, we are happy to take questions um, uh, either from you verbally um, or using the Q&A um, function or in the chat, whichever you're most comfortable with. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Helena. Helena, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you. I'm going to just share my slides. Does that look? Yes, good? that's coming through. Perfect. Right. Um, so first of all, thank you uh, so much for this uh, opportunity. I'm really excited about it um, and very excited to, to be able to discuss it with or hear Karen Sue's uh, thoughts on it later on. So um, much excitement. Um, I want to say before I start that this the thoughts I have on ethnographic philosophy come out of a very sort of a personal, uh, let's say, history of, of having a background in philosophy, uh, doing uh, what I think is philosophical work, but also training, uh, doing anthropological tra training during my PhD and, and using ethnographic methods in my PhD and also in my current postdoc. Uh, so the, the thoughts I'll be presenting today are sort of meta reflections on very much my own uh, philosophical practice and an and attempt to make make sense of that practice. Uh, I promised in the abstract that I would give an example. I've um, had to skip the example in the interest of uh, time and space uh, because I wanted to say something a bit more substantial about ethnography, but I'm happy to discuss examples uh, later on. So uh, what I think is the background for this talk, the sort of background puzzlement or question that you might have in mind when when you try and understand what it is that I'm doing, is something like, what does it mean to, to use ethnographic methods, which are typically developed in other disciplines than philosophy, for philosophical inquiry? Uh, why, why would we do so? What are they good at? Um, is it even legitimate to do? Right, so here is an overview of uh, the talk, I'll start by saying a little bit about engaging with scientific practice and uh, looking towards empirical uh, material in, in philosophy. Then I'll have quite a heavy slide on ethnography uh, and then move into uh, discussing what exactly it is that ethnography, how we can think about ethnography in philosophy by drawing on uh, Hesek Cheng's work on uh, the use of historical case studies and also by highlighting um, views on articulation from Bruno Latour and Joe Rouse. And then finally, I'll try and bring it all uh, together. Right, so let's start. So the first thing I want to raise is, is the question of whether we even want to engage with 
uh, empirical um, material at all. Like, why can't we just stay in our armchairs and think about the world? So uh, first of all, let me just say that I'm not making any claims about sort of philosophy in general having to be empirically oriented. So I don't think that all philosophy has to be empirically oriented. I also am not saying anything like that any empirical orientation in, in philosophy should be ethnographic. So it's really a rather, rather minimal sort of suggestion that we might want to think ethnography is an interesting tool for us, among many other ways of doing philosophy. So in my practice, I am very much embedded in the philosophy of science. In my own practice, I'm very much embedded in the philosophy of science in practice. So you see it, you can also hear it in my vocabulary. Um, and uh, in philosophy of science and practice, there is this encouragement to sort of change the way that we've done philosophy of uh, science from focusing on theories and results towards uh, looking more at processes and actions, uh, doings in science. Now, uh, that might be controversial to some people, but I think uh, here, a quote from N. Kenny in, in an introductory volume to the to the sort of movement. Um, it's very much meant to be an additive and not a, a sort of replacement. Um, so in the sense that when we should, uh, when we look at scientific practice, it's meant to be broadening uh, our philosophical uh, interests and knowledge. And, and so my suggestion is very much along the same lines, using ethnographic philosophy as a sort of uh, uh, way to expand the realm of philosophy. Now, in this sort of expansive sense, uh, I don't take it that um, an interest in how science work is particularly um, controversial. So I think even the sort of opponents or the sort of caricature caric caricatured opposition to philosophy of science in practice, which would be logical positivists, paid some attention to how scientific theories actually were. Um, so um, I think really uh, the sort of suggestion that we might want to pay attention to actual science uh, is not, it's not hopefully not too controversial. What might be a bit more controversial in, in sort of the new wave of uh, empirical, uh, sort of the new push towards an empirical philosophy is what's sometimes thought of as a naturalizing suggestion. So a worry that uh, the suggestion might be that philosophy should be tied into empirical methods or depend on empirical evidence. And then uh, from this, a worry that uh, if we uh, sort of submit ourselves to this, uh, we will struggle to provide the prescriptive elements which philosophy is, is, is meant to provide and just collapse into other fields like psychology or anthropology or other descriptive, um, descriptive social sciences. So um, this worry is particularly sort of a, articulated in the context of experimental philosophy, but I think the same goes for these types of qualitative um, uh, engagement in philosophy of science. So in uh, suggestions for a sign uh, for a practice turn, there is actually some calls for reorienting philosophy towards the descriptive uh, rather than the prescriptive. But I think we can read this not so much as a as a sort of reaction against prescriptive concept concept articulation, but more as as a call for starting out from description, but not necessarily remaining there. And so this is very much how I, 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 th I think of my practice is starting out from, um, from description, but not necessarily remaining there. Personally, I think there might be something rather plausible about the idea that philosophy is also in the end accountable to uh, experiential evidence, but I don't think that uh, the claims I'll make here um, need to commit to that. Instead, I'll make this rather sort of minimal claim, I think, uh, that when we philosophize about concrete practices or phenomena, so this could be clinical reasoning or mathematical proof giving, we, are, we ought to acquaint ourselves with the phenomena and practices to some extent. So we're obliged to at least gain, gain some grasp on what these uh, practices or phenomena look like. Okay. From this claim, of course, we might ask, 
what does it mean to acquaint ourselves, how, how we meant to acquaint ourselves and to what extent exactly. I'm not gonna try and, and give any sort of satisfactory, uh, necessary and sufficient um, account of this. Uh, but I hope at the end of the talk that you'll have a sense of how I think this uh, might go for uh, ethnographic philosophy at least. I just want to say that in philosophy of science and practice, there are many different ways of engaging and acquainting ourselves with uh, actual scientific practices. Um, I'll, I'll focus on ethnography in this talk. Um, and I'm going to suggest that ethnography does some things better than other uh, types of uh, making ourselves acquainted, but that's not to say that other types of acquaintances are not also valuable and can do different things perhaps or do some of the same things. Okay, so what is ethnography? So I've been referring now to ethnography sort of casually, and I suspect that many of you, especially since you, you knew the title of my talk, have some um, idea about what uh, ethnography might be. So it's sort of a qualitative method that relies on field work. And typically uh, we associate this with uh, anthropology or sociology. Sorry, no. Um, also with ethnology and social, but also with ethnology and social studies of science, uh, sorry, social psychology, science and technology studies and social studies of uh, knowledge. Um, so as a method, as ethnography is enormously varied between these different fields, but also in subfields uh, within each of these fields. And I have no intention of giving um, sort of a, uh, a very systematic account of what this method is that I can then rely on and, and pass on to you. Um, instead, I'm gonna give some very general features of ethnography that I think tell us something important about what ethnography can do as opposed to other qualitative methods, and then um, rely to some extent on, on, on what I think most of you will already know about the method. Oh. Okay, so first of all, ethnography is an ambiguous term, uh, so it can both mean a method, but it can also mean um, uh, the, a piece of writing, so typically the book that uh, drafts up all of the uh, knowledge that we have about a particular culture of people. So I use the sense, uh, the term in a methodological sense or a method sense, implying broadly the use of fieldwork and a very pragmatic approach to uh, the choice and integration of different sources and methods. So I'm going to argue that when we use ethnography as a method in philosophy, it is explicitly not the aim to write ethnographies in the term of, in the, term of the book. Um, rather, the aim is uh, concept articulation um, and ethnography works particularly well for this uh, in terms of uh, exploring embodied concepts. Right, second. So here are some key features uh, that I think can generally be posited around, about ethnography. Again, there are many variants of this. And I've taken these features from uh, two uh, quite well-established uh, ethnographers called Hammersley and Atkinson. Um, so I won't read all of them out, um, but generally they imply that ethnography is pragmatic um, and open in nature. Uh, and of course, qualitative, so oriented towards uh, meanings and interpretations. Now for the two first points, which is about uh, the interest, uh, the, the target of ethnography being the, the concept or the actions or the phenomena or whatever it is in their everyday context. And the second point about using a range of sources, but um, in particular, what is sometimes referred to as participant observation, I think there are two important um, takeaways or two important things to highlight. So one is the idea that sometimes ethnographers talk about their methods as a being with or being there. And so another ethnographer writes um, about uh, their method. 
fieldwork stresses the, con and I quote, fieldwork stresses the continuous presence of the researcher in the field, as opposed to grab it and run uh, methodologies like surveys, in-depth interviews, or analyses of documents and recordings. Now, this is one point. And then the other point is that being embedded in the everyday uh, context and using all of these different methods, including all of your different senses, means that uh, ethnography is uh, at a, a centrally situated, um, concepts that are central for ethnography are situatedness, embodiment, and immersion. As for the third point, which has to do with the relative unstructuredness of the method, and here there are two aspects to the unstructuredness. So one is the way in which uh, the research design is not fixed from the outset, and the second one is, is where the, the categories of interest are also not set uh, before you start analyzing. So both the method and the, the categories for anal analysis develop as you go along. Now, um, this, I think, points to the way in which ethnography is also inherently iterative and explorative. So that many inquiries set out to explore things that uh, they don't really quite know about yet. But in ethnography, is typically, it's typically seen as a virtue that you can demonstrate how your uh, research design changed or how your categories and conceptions changed as you went along in the fieldwork and gained new understanding of the field and realized that um, certain things were important over, over others. So in part, this sort of um, unstructuredness of ethnography is um, is due to the the very sort of embeddedness in in everyday context, which, and I'm quoting Kirsten Hestrup here, always has a historical surplus of events, actions, and thoughts that may linger without ne necessarily contributing to the larger order as perceived, but provides possible uh, possible sites of resistance or source of sources of new historical turns. So the idea here being that when you enter into the ethnographic field, um, at first it isn't clear which particular uh, events are going to be uh, important, which event might late, events might later on turn out to, to be um, sites of resistance or uh, historical turns in your work. So here, uh, it's not just the case that uh, you don't have the research design and it develops as you go, and then you don't have the uh, the categories and then you you sort of develop those as you start doing the analysis, it's rather the case that both the research design and the collecting of material and the analysis all happen at the same time in conversation with each other, pushing back and forth, uh, sort of phrasing what, uh, framing what exactly it is that we think are um, uh, the, the concepts and the, the phenomena at interest. Okay. Finally, I want to say something about uh, getting it right. So being open and pragmatic and immersive and embodied and explorative and all these terms that I've used now, of course, uh, has some consequences for the ways in which we evaluate the quality of the work. So we can't just use the standard notions of validity or uh, the standard inferential warrants that we might use in, for example, um, uh, uh, natural sciences. So again, referencing uh, Hestrup, she argues that uh, whether or not we think that in principle there is something like the fully adequate account of a culture or a phenomenon, and this can be a, a sort of disputed question in, even in anthropology, it's, it's just a, a complete practical <laughs> impossibility to give any such full account. So rather, she says, and I quote, the point of anthropology is not to tell the world as it is, which would be practically impossible, but to interpret it and suggest possible theoretical connections within it as perceived and in inferred from being in touch with a world that cannot be taken for granted. So she illustrates what she means by this quote, uh, recounting uh, one of her own experiences doing fieldwork. So she was doing fieldwork on uh, what's called the hidden people in Icelandic culture. So it's a sort of uh, uh, elvish uh, kind of creature. 
And she went there to do field work and she recounts how she spent months listening and collecting, uh, listening to and collecting stories about these hidden people, drawing up accounts on uh, what kinds of roles they would play in Icelandic mythology, but also in the common everyday practices. And then she notes that she only really fully understood this, the significance of these creatures, of the hidden people, not as mere myth, but as something that was very present about perhaps not entirely real, but very present beings. After one day, she found herself alone in the Icelandic mountains on a misty afternoon. And she writes, I quote, in the mist, my fear of being lost was further enforced by the intense feeling of nebulous figures emerging out of it, end of quote. So this experience significantly changed the way that she understood the hidden people, not so much as something that she could, you know, convey to other researchers, but it's something that made her uh, change the way she asked questions of people. And here I quote again. I was no longer asking for information about a category, but inquiring about significant experience, end of quote. So ethnography then is not, uh, ethnography then depends uh, and allows for questions that take into account what I think of as internal significance. Um, uh, so the quality of an ethnographic, of ethnographic fieldwork relates not so much to the ways in which it captures reality, but to the ways in which it manages to capture relations and nuances of significance uh, for uh, this internal way of making sense of things. So inter by internal, I mean inside of the culture that you're um, exploring. Now, and this, as I said already, when I was talking about point three, point three is often demonstrated through showing how engaging and in interacting with the field actually changed the way that we conceptualize the interest the interesting categories. Now, ethnography is still an empirical practice, and while getting it right doesn't necessarily mean factual correspondence, there is still an interest in getting it uh, right. So Hester writes here, anthropology is realist in the sense of having to take perceived reality seriously. The ethical demand is to get it right, not in any ontological sense, but in being true to the world under study. Getting it right is backed by anthropologists being in touch with reality, not by standing outside it looking for evidence. Okay. Um, so while I think that if we want to do ethnographic philosophy, we should adhere to at least a broad amount of these uh, general characteristic of ethnography. Uh, otherwise, there is no point in calling it ethnographic philosophy. I also think that the method changes and, and certain things might change when we use the method for um, something that has different interests. And in particular, I think the criteria for validity and relevance change. So let me give you an intuitive example here. So imagine um, two cases, one in which uh, an anthropologist is studying the notion of temperature as used by a particular subgroup of cosmologists. So this is the anthropologist in entering the field alien to the language of the, or the practices of the cosmologists. And another in which a philosopher is uh, conducting ethnographic philosophy to investigate the same kind of thing. Let's say that both of them arrive at the idea that under certain conditions, uh, this group allows for two different kinds of, uh, two different conceptions of, of temperature. One in which temperature is a continuous property and one in which it is not. So both the philosopher and the anthropologist come to this and make some theoretical observations about it. Now say that it turns out that they've misunderstood the situation. And in fact, the cosmologists we're only employing one notion of temperature. Perhaps they, the anthropologist and the philosophers just didn't have the right mathematical training to see this. Now, we might also know that in fact, in other groups of cosmologists, not in this particular group, but in other groups, it does seem to be the case that there are two different notions of um, uh, temperature at play. So here, I think we would argue that the work of the anthropology has become, anthropologist has become obsolete 
it simply failed to be realist in the uh, aspect that uh, Hestrop highlighted. Whereas while we might have some questions about why the philosopher got this so wrong to begin with, it's not obvious to me that uh, the same will be the case for the conceptual work that the philosopher has done on temperature. So we might place a bit less co uh, confidence in the work, uh, but it doesn't seem to lead to direct dismissal of the work. On the other hand, let's say it turns out that they were right about the cosmologists, but that this inference uh, only applies to this particular subgroup of cosmologists, has no place in the debate on temperature generally, and doesn't contribute any new philosophical uh, perspectives. So here I think we might say that uh, it, it vastly decreases the value of the philosophical work, uh, doesn't necessarily lead to dismissal of it, but it decreases the value quite drastically, whereas that's not necessarily the case for um, the anthropologist. The anthropologist did, after all, get, get it right. So one way to phrase this is to say that anthropology is more generally more directed towards internal validity, whereas uh, philosophy is generally uh, more aimed towards external validity. So getting uh, getting it right for the sake of conceptual uh, understanding concepts rather than for the sake of understanding cultures. Uh, yeah, so here is a quote from Sellers saying that the the aim uh, of philosophy is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. So I just want to say that I don't think ethnography or anthropology and philosophy are sort of very clearly distinct kinds of things. And I'm sure there are lots of ways of doing in between um, in between methods and thoughts and, and activities. Uh, but I do think that as sort of condensed or at their core practices, there are different interests at play. Okay, so let's turn now to um, how I think uh, ethnography can fit into philosophical inquiry. So here I suggest that we take note from Hesek Cheng's work on a parallel issue of uh, the role of historical case studies in philosophy of science. So Cheng uh, rejects the idea that we should be using historical case studies as evidence for philosophical claims. Um, and instead, he suggests that the relation between philosophical concepts and historical cases is uh, not one of, uh, yeah, now there's this line over it, but not one of uh, particular instantiation of general ideas, but rather as one of concrete episodes from which we can abstract, uh, um, articulate abstract meaning making concepts. So he elaborates a bit further on this by writing, uh, by giving in a sort of a metaphor, an example of this. If we extract abstract insight from the account of a specific concrete episode, that is not so much a process of generalization as one of articulation of what was already put into it. When we have an episode of The Simpsons or Buffy the Vampire Slayer or what have you, the episode is not really a case or an example of whatever the general idea is. Uh, the general idea of the show might be but the episode is a concrete instantiation of the general concept. And each episode also contributes to the articulation of the general concept. So in the work for with historical case studies and for Cheng, and, and I suggest that similar something similar might be the case for ethnographic methods, the primary target is, target is concept articulation rather than evidence as a form of hermeneutic, hermeneutic abstraction um, so studying the cosmologists, for example, philosophers study one episode of scientific practice related to temperature in order to inquire and use this episode to articulate a more abstract concept of temperature that is then helpful in making a sense of the wider phenomenon in science, of which, of course, uh, this particular subgroup uh, is part. Now, second, Cheng introduces uh, some ideas about how we might go about evaluating this type of practice um, and he and and depending on uh, seeing seeing the role of case studies in, in this light. So I think Chang lists two uh, criteria, but I think there are actually three 
the first one, I think, remains sort of um, inarticulate. Uh, oh, sorry, here. Um, and has to do with putting words to uh, some sort of conception that makes sense of the episode at hand. So how can we think about temperature in a way that makes the actions and utterances of the cosmologists meaningful and reveals something about the significance that this notion plays in their practice? So the better or worse we are at coming up with such a concept, the more or less successful we might be in the, in the concrete. Here, I think historians and anthropologists and philosophers share uh, the remit of their inquiry. Now, Chang then adds that, especially when we do this with uh, philosophical interests in mind, we might care particularly about the cogency of the concept, both as sort of an internal cogency of the concept, but also in terms of its cogency with philosophical ideas more broadly. And secondly, uh, we should care about the transferability and the value of the concept in other contexts. Uh, so the breadth of this uh, transferability or the let's say, for lack of better word, the depth of the value that it contributes might say something about the uh, quality of the work that we're doing. And here's just a quote from Dewey that we should ask, does it end in conclusions which when they are referred back to ordinary life experiences and the predicaments render them more insightful, more luminous to us and make our dealings with them more fruitful? Sorry. Now, I just want to gesture or, or maybe sort of stipulate that by not actually spelling out this first step, so the step that I've called zero on my slide, I take it that Cheng shares my intuition that for philosophy, the main evaluative emphasis is going to be on the latter two aspects, whereas I think at least for, for in Hestrup's uh, formulation, the evaluation uh, for anthropology lies in the in the first instance in the first uh, criterion so to sum up here uh, the criteria of success of empirical inquiry and philosophy is not correspondence represent correspondence or representability as it would be if we wanted to do uh, um, inductions um, nor is it universality but it's neither in the end this sort of anthropological accuracy. Rather, what we're aiming at is uh, to find opportunities to generate new and useful concepts or to develop our concepts usefully and helpfully. Now, Cheng is rather humble. He says that using case studies might be a heuristic, a sort of shortcut, but it, it's not necessarily necessary uh, for philosophy. I want to amp this up a little bit and say, well, I don't think uh, using case studies or using empirical uh, studies is necessary for philosophy, but referring to my uh, first or second slide, I want to say that at least if we're philosophizing about actual phenomena or practices, we ought to articulate our concepts in dialogue with these phenomena. Okay, so articulation then is really important. Uh, when we think about what philosophy does uh, with empirical studies. So Cheng takes this to mean something like coming up with an abstract, abstract idea that makes sense of an episode. But um, I think that can be spelled out in many different ways. And I'm going to try and spell it out in two ways that uh, helpfully tells us what I think ethnography can do. So first, I'm going to talk about work of Bruno Latour who treats the notion of articulation in his article, How to Talk About the Body. And so this article is basically a strong argument against the idea that um, philosophy should be disembodied and provide a God's eye view. And articulation then is not about truth or making assertions. It's rather about understanding connections, effects, and processes. And in fact, uh, Latour talks about articulation not as a, a sort of thing, but as a process of becoming articulate. Um, so becoming articulate here is, oh, sorry, is uh, synonymous with um, learning to be affected, meaning effectuated, moved, 
put into motion by other entities, humans and non-humans. Sorry, my, there you go. Um, he elaborates on this idea by an analogy to training noses in the perfume industry. So here, relatively inarticulate noses um, get these uh, odor kits, which help them develop their sense of smell. So the idea is that each of these files will have different smells in them, and the outermost files will have most difference between them, whereas the two middle ones will have very little difference between them. As the training progresses, these noses, noses uh, in uh, the perfume industry articulate their olfactory senses, senses so that they become uh, affected by smaller and smaller differences. So leading to a more nuanced and articulate sense of smell. Um, sorry, my Zoom window is being a bit annoying. There you go. Um, so articulation then, does not mean ability to talk with authority, but uh, being affected by difference, Latour writes. Importantly, articulation here is sensitivity to difference, but also to relation. So articulate noses are not just able to distinguish between files, but also to place them in relation to each other. What I take from this uh, account from Latour is that articulation in philosophy could be something like the development of concept sensibility. So concepts like noses can be better or worse at picking up or making sense of nuances, and we can work to improve this ability. When we articulate concepts in case studies, then the aim is not to make assertions about what is true of the episode, but to work towards concepts that help us pick out and understand aspects of the episode, uh, their differences and their relations. So for cosmology, for example, we want a concept of temperature for the cosmology case that I mentioned. We want a concept of temperature that does not just sort of claim something that's minimally true of all cases of, of all uses of temperature in the case, but we want a concept that helps us understand to what degree the use of the notion differs between different contexts um, and, and how, uh, how different or alike those different uh, conceptions are. Okay, moving on to Rouse. Rouse has a bit of a different interest from Latour. So he writes about articulation in his book, Articulating the World, which is an attempt to sort of uh, put forward a convincing naturalist account of uh, concepts and philosophy. Um, so for Rouse, we don't just articulate concepts, but rather concepts articulate the world, meaning that concepts set up the space of reason within which the world becomes meaningful for us. So, Rouse has a, a, a slightly different way of using the notion, the, the articulation and concept than I think at least the Tour and Chang, they all have slightly different interests. But I'll try and, and, and say something at the end about how, how I think his notion then is helpful for, for understanding Cheng's ideas. So let me highlight two aspects of Rouse's account of concepts. So first, concepts are normative. Here, at least in a sort of flat account of, of, of flat um, view on Latour's account, Rouse differs quite radically from the two in that he takes concepts to be normative rather than just descriptive. Um, so he aligns himself with thinkers like Sellers and Brandom. Uh, concepts are not just about responsiveness to uh, different features of the world, um, but they are about responsibility towards the concepts. So concepts involve not just the ability to differentiate, but also norms for appropriate use, possible alternatives, so, for example, articulating the name uh, names of multiple hues of blue is not just, as Latour would stress, about responding accurately to differences of blue. So, say, for example, taking the Seine on my slide to be Cambridge blue implies that it uh, could have also been indigo, 
but it can't insofar as it's uh, Cambridge blue, whereas it has no bearings on whether or not the stain has two or three drapings. So Rouse writes, uh, what defines a conceptually articulated space is its modal character, such as the um, such that an organism's life active life activities are directed in response to not only its actual setting, but also possible ways it might be, and consequently towards how things ought to be in accord with those possibilities. Now, secondly, concepts for us can be tacit and may even be nonverbal. So one consequence of taking uh, concepts to be normative rather than representative is that we don't have to claim that practic practitioners actively have these concepts in mind while performing certain role, uh, tasks. So Rouse thinks this is a, an advantage that solves a long-standing debate in philosophy because it explains why experts in the state of flow uh, seem to be pretty good at normatively navigating um, and identifying mistakes, say, in a game of chess. Uh, even when they report not having any active representations of chess, at least not until they make the mistake. So for philosophy of science, uh, this might lead us to think that um, scientists who do skilled performances in the laboratory, for example, um, are regulated by concepts of, for example, temperature, where they might not necessarily have these concepts present in mind or uh, might not um, Tell us about them if we ask. So contrary to uh, Sellers and Brandom, uh, Rouse does not think that in the end, the space of reason uh, within which we articulate the world and make the world meaningful has to be um, linguistic. And he then argues that that's sort of Scientists may have implicit concepts or, or these uh, normative concepts that guide their actions, but those activities that science partake in, so uh, making new phenomena, making up, making new patterns more salient, uh, and so on, these sort of very material practices that science scientists uh, partake in, are part of what makes up and reconfigures the space of reason. So here, I think uh, Rouse aligns himself a bit more with Latour's noses in the sense that articulation is also about material practices and skills that allow us to see new things. Right, so here is why I think I should make a note about the translation of this into Cheng's uh, suggestion that we use cases to um, articulate um, abstract ideas. So in Cheng's case, at least, uh, if we take it to be a suggestion for philosophy, um, I think we will have to claim that uh, concept articulation relies on making um, things explicit in language. Um, but sort of um, translating then Rouse's idea that scientists and the practices that scientists do in the implicit may have bearing on the space of reason it seems plausible that the one task, at least of philosophy, is to make exactly these concepts as they are tacit and normative uh, explicit. So developing sensitive, sensible and cogent linguistic concepts of temperature or uh, epistemic iteration or so on that express these uh, norms of scientific practice and phenomena. Okay. Right. Let's do a bit of uh, recapping. So ethnography as a method is immersive, pragmatic, open, embodied, and explorative, studies relations, significant significances of meanings, phenomena, and practices. It draws on a multitude of sources and emphasizes being with it develops its focus and interest through iteration and entwined data collection and, anal and analysis. Right. Um, so how then does this tie up with uh, 
what I've said about philosophy. Hopefully, it's already quite obvious how ethnographic studies would be able to act in a similar way to historical case studies on Chang's account. Um, so as delimited concrete episodes where we uh, develop concepts uh, to make them meaningful and then evaluate these concepts through their cogency and uh, usefulness. Now, one upshot of uh, the accounts of articulation that I've drawn from um, Rouse and Latour is that um, ethnography allows us to articulate something through developing embodied sensibilities, uh, developing the embodied sensibilities of the concept in, a in the nuanced world that is around us. So this may be the case for, for many um, empirical engagements, uh, but ethnography in particular as an immersive and iterative method allows this articulation to be an extended process. So literally ethnography is using the ethnographer as a nose that trains in the field until they reach a certain level of ability to differentiate uh, nuances. In addition to this, um, ethnography as a method aims at grasping not just the spoken and, dis and descriptive content of a group under study, but its open and embodied approaches um, aimed at developing, uh, so we can use it to develop a sensitivity towards the concepts and actions and the significance in particular uh, that they provide in setting up the normative framework in which groups act. So even when these normative frameworks are either implicit or tacit or, or uh, set up not by um, sort of uh, linguistic representations, but uh, reconfigured through uh, changes in practice or changes in, in scientific material productivity, for example. Right. So... Um, Ethnographic philosophy becomes one tool to um, develop uh, cogent and useful concepts for philosophical inquiry into scientific practices, and in particular, uh, a tool that helps us uh, make concepts sensitive to nuances of the sciences and of practices, but also a tool that helps us put into words the um, regulators and drivers of scientific actions. And I just want to end now with a quote from uh, Latour. This is one of my favorite qu quotes uh, about why we should, even as philosophers, be engaged in the world. So Latour writes, ah, sighs the traditional subject. If only I could extract myself from this narrow-minded body and roam the, through the cosmos unfettered by any instrument, I would see the world as it is, without words, without models, without controversies, silent and contemplative. Really, replies the articulated body, with some benign surprise. Why do you wish to be dead? For myself, I want to be alive, and thus I want more words, more controversies, more artificial settings, more instrument, so as to become more sensitive to even more differences. My kingdom for a more embodied body. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your comments and statements and questions. And um, over to Karen Sue. Yes, thank you, Helena, for that presentation. And so now we have the opportunity to hear Karen Sue Tosik, who is coming to us um, from the Department of Anthropology uh, here at the University of Minnesota. She works on anthropolo anthropological questions related to both the sciences and medicine and is in a perfect position to offer comments. Therefore, Karen, Sue, I'm turning things over to you. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to do this. And thank you so much, Helena, for, I, I thought, a really wonderful presentation. Um, 
I definitely learned a lot from reading the paper and even more from hearing your presentation. I really appreciated your ethnography slide and your very sophisticated discussion of ethnography, um, which I'll come back to. Um, I do want to say I feel quite ill-equipped for this task. Um, my colleague Lynn Morgan has made the point that cross-disciplinary excursions are risky enterprises. Uh, one can easily miss signposts or stumble over obstacles that insiders would know to avoid. And I think it's very likely that that will happen in my comments, but um, I hope that there will be some nuggets here that will be um, thought provoking for you. Um, and in fact, this is precisely the task of the ethnographer to come to a nuanced understanding of the insider's view, um, including all of the taken for granted assumptions behind or underlying that view. Uh, philosophers and anthropologists as, anthropologists, as Lynn Morgan points out, are in, and as you've talked about in your presentation, engaged in quite different intellectual projects. So, Philosophers use formal logic and analogical arguments to ponder fundamental questions of ontology, metaphysics, and ethics, while cultural anthropologists use ethnography to document the variability of human thought and experience using what Clifford Gertz called thick description. And a classic example um, of this comes from E.E. E. Evans Pritchard's study of the Azande which precisely takes up the question of empiricism and the empirical world. And of course, if you've read a lot of Latour, you're probably have a little taste of Evans Pritchard's work on the Azande, but I just wanna say a little bit about that here. So Evans Pritchard was a prolific British social anthropologist. And in 1937, he published his book, um, one of his many books, but this one was called Witchcraft Oracles and Magic Among the Azande. And the book was organized around a puzzle. The Azande impressed Evans Pritchard as rational, empirical, and progressive um, in every way except in one area. And that was that they believed in the existence of Zande witches and in the efficacy of oracles. And the book was essentially an effort to solve this puzzle. Earlier anthropologists had attempted to explain why entire societies might harbor such beliefs but their explanations were generally framed in terms of either individual psychology or collective mentalities. And Evans Pritchard, drawing on his rich ethnography, his long-term um, ethnographic work with the Azande, redefined the puzzle of what he perceived to be enduring nonsense in two ways. He argued first that Zande witchcraft had to be understood in terms of social facts rather than individual beliefs. And second, he argued that fact making cannot be reduced to the cognitive operations of individuals. He argued that facts concerning witches are the product of an integrated system composed of technology, standards, social conventions, taken for granted knowledge, affective states, and facts of nature. So I hope you're seeing a resonance here with the sort of natural sciences, right? Um, an integrated system composed of technology, standards, social conventions, taken for granted knowledge, affective states, and facts of nature. So Evans Pritchard made the point that since these kinds of systems are quite explicitly concerned with the relationship between a knower and the objects and events that they claim to know, and because they are concerned with the technologies through which these facts are made manifest, they are part of culture. And Evans Pritchard argued that the culture of Zande witchcraft was empirical. It made predictions. And like all empirical systems, it occasionally produced anomalous results. The Zande, the Azande, Evans Pritchard told us, were aware of the anomalies, but accommodated them in a way that fueled their confidence in their fact-making technology. The culture of Zande witchcraft worked so well that its failures were not perceived as being socially significant. 
So the anthropologist Byron Good makes the point that in elaborating Zonde engagement with rich, witchcraft and oracles, Evans Pritchard makes explicit many of the assumptions found in the ideas about rationality that are shared in the context of biomedicine and in the life sciences. And of course, this is also why um, Latour talks about this case. Um, it's a little easier to think about this outside of medicine, and Latour gives us the nice example of meteorology as reflecting something like what Evans Pritchard describes for the Azande. Um, meteorology is the product of an integrated system composed of technology, standards, social conventions, taken for granted knowledge, affective states, and facts of nature. Meteorologists make predictions. They frequently produce anomal anomalous results, yet we accommodate their failures and do not perceive them as being socially significant. So I wanted to go into that example as some background of you know, the value of um, the kind of rich analysis you can get um, about knowledge making practices from uh, ethnographic approaches. Um, and I think one of the tensions here, um, even within anthropology, but even more between anthropology and philosophy is a tension between the particular and the universal. Um, I wanna go back to some of the points you made explicitly, Helena, in um, your discussion of ethnography and what it involves. Um, one of the, things that you didn't say explicitly, which I think is important to recognize, is uh, that with ethnography, the body is itself a research tool. And so there is this, it's an embodied practice. Um, you're, you're there, you're engaged, um, you're interacting, you're participating, the whole participant observation phenomena um, has also been described as a kind of deep hanging out. And you ask um, in your, um, in the written version of your paper, you make the point that a central question for you is what does it mean to use ethnographic methods and philosophical inquiry? And in your presentation, I really appreciated your reference to, the, uh, to this question of why can't we just sit in our armchair and, armchairs and do philosophy? Because in, a, in many ways, ethnography grew out of a critique of a history of what was, is now called armchair ethnography. You know, um, Cambridge and Oxford uh, dons sitting in their armchairs and reading reports from explorers and missionaries um, and colonizers and, you know, writing up analyses of those people um, without having, having actually gone there and learned firsthand what it is like to be immersed in those cultures. And so um, there is that history in anthropology. It's actually now very old. Um, when you talked about, you, you you brought in this idea of um, the turn towards practice in philosophy. And I was wondering whether or not um, Pierre Bourdieu comes in to your thinking about that in any way, because you know, his one of his major works was his book, Outline of a Theory of Practice, where he talks about the concept of habitus, which is also a theory of embodiment. It seemed like it was probably could be really useful for thinking about um, uh, the turn towards practice in philosophy. Um, it also remind your discussion of practice also reminded me of Céline Lefebvre, a British, I'm sorry, a French um, uh, scholar who works in medical humanities. She's also a philosopher, trained in philosophy and she's engaged in what she calls field philosophy. And I was wondering if you think of that as similar to um, ethnography. Uh, her focus is on exploring this philosophical questions of care through an interactive process that foregrounds the perspective and experiences of patients um, because her, her approach is very empirical, but it's also prescriptive. Um, 
I was also curious to know um, how you think about Anna Marie Moll's work in relation to what you're doing. She was trained as a philosopher, but is in an anthropology department and widely read in anthropology, STS and SSK. So yeah, I was curious if you, um, uh, how her approach comes into how you're thinking about um, philosophical ethnography. Um, let's see, um, we don't have a lot more time, so I just want to um, see what other key points I want to make. Right, so you know, your work really made me think about anthropology embodiment and knowledge and the anthropology of science. So, you know, Emily Martin um, is a key figure here. Um, I'm gonna say a few things about her work, but, um, but you know, she started working in the anthropology of science in the 1980s, but really this history goes back to Franz Boas, who in the 19th century um, was arguing that, um, well, late 19th, 19th century, early 20th century was arguing that uh, natural scientists tend have a tendency to reproduce, reproduce cultural assumptions of, of the day in their findings. Um, and, but he also wanted us to really think about the plasticity of the body and embodiment. And he, in his study of the um, the Baffin Islanders up in the Canadian Arctic um, that he did, he has this fascinating discussion of how, um, and I thought of this when you were talking about Cambridge Blue and the sort of creating or labeling things um, in cogent ways. So one of the things he discovered when he, and he very much thought of himself as a natural scientist, but one of the things he discovered there was that the Baffin Islanders could see shades of blue um, and of white that he was incapable of seeing. And he did all these sort of um, natural science experiments to try and figure out what they were seeing. And he came to understand that the eye was not biologically given, but that it was culturally produced and that it was um, a product of the cultural context in which it lived. Um, and so these kinds of, of things going back a really quite a long time in anthropology really challenge our thinking about um, about um, the world as we know it, right? Um, and how scientific discourses are suffused with cultural common sense. And one of the things that I think is really useful about ethnography is that it helps excavate the cultural specificity of that common sense and the ways it gets imported into and out of scientific descriptions and narratives. And this is critical to understanding not just what concepts are cogent, but how they are understood to be cogent or how they are made cogent. And it's not just about whether they are transferable and valuable, but how they get transferred and valued or made valuable. So by doing, the, by doing this kind of work, we illuminate the key everyday practices and ways of seeing that we generally take for granted. Um, let me just see. Um, so one of the things that I think is important, um, and I was I really appreciated that you got you were trained in ethnography as part of your graduate training because I do really worry about people thinking, oh, and ethnography is just deep hanging out. So like I can do that um, without without really um, uh, any kind of training. And one of the things that anthropologists bring to their ethno ethnographic approach 
is exposure to the rich literature of other peoples and their views of the world, um, which supports a perspective that questions seemingly natural systems. Um, and in that way, it's a very Wittgenstein, well, again, I'm not a philosopher, but I think of it from what I know of Wittgenstein, it seems like a very Wittgensteinian approach to throwing up for question things that ordinary language seems to assume to be true. Um, and similarly, ethnography asks us to step back behind the assumptions that operate invisibly in both language and in the way we conceptualize the world and say, does it have to be that way? So ethnography is an iterative process um, and that's a critical dimension of ethnography and the ability to get what Hustrup makes the point of, you know, getting it right. But also an important dimension of ethnography is the recognition that people don't always do or think what they say they do, and they don't always um, do what they say and think. And that's part of why the ethnographic approach is so valuable, because you can learn that from being present. And so it seems to me um, that getting something empirically wrong is often an important aha moment in ethnography. Um, you talked about this as, as, you know, where ethnographers sort of reframe their, their thinking about things because of having been immersed in a particular field site. Um, and so it's, it is often getting something empirically wrong that leads to an important aha moment in which the ethnographer's perspective is reshaped and reoriented. And it seems to me that that's really a critical dimension of using ethnography um, um, in philosophy in terms of thinking about what it takes to articulate a concept. Um, let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to say before. I have, I have a few questions. Let me just pose some of my questions. Um, my primary question is about reflexivity. Um, reflexivity is really a critical dimension of ethnography, but I'm wondering how it operates in philosophy and how you see it operating in ethnographic philosophy. Uh, a second question comes from your point about this issue of naturalizing. Um, in anthropology, there is a really important theory of naturalizing power. It's one of the things that we think we are engaged in is trying to understand how people naturalize power. Um, and I wonder if that's a concept that has emerged in, um, in philosophy. Um, and um, I'm gonna leave it with those. Uh, with those, well, I guess the third question is, um, because power is so central to the ethnographic approach, whether, and so it's related to this issue of naturalizing power, how you see issues of power operating in um, ethnographic philosophy. So I'll leave it there. Um, feel free to say, these aren't the questions that are interesting to me, or um, I'm curious to hear what you think about them. Thank you so much, Karen Sue. Uh, really appreciate that commentary. Um, so I'm going to give uh, Helena a chance to respond uh, to whatever portion of the comments uh, she wants to. But uh, before she does that, let me highlight that immediately after that, we will have the opportunity for uh, questions um, from the audience. So if you have a question, please feel free to uh, hit the raise hand function or type it into the Q&A or the chat, and we'll be able to turn to those uh, as soon as Helena finishes this uh, reaction. So, Helena? Right. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. So that was lots of really interesting things that I could, we could probably talk for hours. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it short so that people can also um, ask questions. So first thing I wanted to say is I really appreciate you bringing up armchair ethnography. I hadn't really thought about that, but I think it's a really, um, it's a it's a it's a funny parallel. Um, also, I wanted to say that uh, if I didn't stress this enough, 
ethnography is really hard and even though I've had training I still struggle because I haven't had the full sort of five-year um, undergrad and, and postgrad um, training so so anyone who's thinking about doing ethnography please um, take it very uh, seriously it's it's not a it's not an easy task uh, for a philosopher um, then a brief comment on Anne-Marie Moll. I really like her work. She's actually one of the reasons I started to write about this topic because I was, I find, found it really strange that I sort of identified with her work, but then anthropologists would suggest her to me as a philosopher, but philosophers would think of her as an anthropologist. And I was really struggling to find out <laughs> um, why exactly that was and what it meant to be an anthropologist doing something like philosophy and and what it meant to be um, a, a philosopher doing something like ethnography um, and so the sort of these in-between figures like Latour as well uh, was sort of uh, very much an inspiration for me to try and, and put some words into into these ways in which these types of things can come together. Um, Maybe just one, I don't have much to say about power, but on the notion of reflexivity. So one thing that that I've been I've been wondering a lot about is how uh, I think actually lots of philosophers do hang out and, and maybe they don't use ethnograph ethnographic methods and they don't have training, but they do a lot of hanging out and talking to scientists or whatever practitioners that they're philosophizing about, or maybe they're even themselves um, used to be scientists and, and so on. Uh, but what tends to happen in philosophy is that there is no method chapter, uh, section in, in, in uh, chapter, but also a uh, section in, in articles. And so, um, I think it's, it's one of, um, one of Rein, Hentja Reinberger's books where he, he keeps alluding to these conversations that he has, he's had with scientists. And then there is a single footnote somewhere that said, says that for a couple of years he was sort of philosopher in residence in or historian in residence in a particular lab that he's writing about but this is never sort of explicitly addressed in the text and the ways in which he engaged with these scientists is never really explained um, so this makes it really hard to evaluate um, what what exactly happened in 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 as the as the source of some of his reflections and and this is not to to sort of uh call out his work I've, I've spoken to him about this but and it's more to say that the philosophical genre doesn't really allow for reflectivity and I think this is actually a major um, problem if we want to be doing um, qualitative uh, work we need to find space to have this um, these sections that are reflexive about uh, what our own role and and placement in the in the field work was Okay, I think that was my immediate thoughts, but I have there was so much. So thank you for this, and um, let's yeah, let's, let's, let's open things up uh, for general questions uh, from the audience. Uh, now is your opportunity to uh, ask. Again, you can either use the sh raise hand function um, to ask the question, or uh, use uh, drop it in a chat to us or the Q&A. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's get started here uh, with Corey. Uh, Corey, you should be able to talk now uh, after you unmute yourself. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Um, so I was interested, uh, you quoted an anthropologist whose name I've uh, forgotten um, as saying that they saw their practice as realist or realistic. Um, and of course, people can use terms however they want, but I was struck by that quote because what they were saying is um, realist didn't seem to me to match up with what philosophers would say is realist. Um, so I was wondering uh, how you saw ethnography as fitting into um, 
sort of the, the questions about realism as philosophers might ask them? Do you think it's just sort of orthogonal to those kinds of questions? Um, do you think you can get kind of realist conclusions in, in a sort of, you know, the way that uh, someone like Chakravarti or Silos wants to have realist conclusions um, out of ethnography? Or do you think it's just doing something else altogether? Uh, right, so um, first of all, let me say, I think the quote has realist in quotation marks. So I think the author Hestrop is very aware that she's using it in a, in a non sort of literal sense. What I think she's implying with it is that if you want to, when you're in empirical science, you do want to sort of say that you're getting at the empirical world to some degree. So similarly, um, historians uh, would tend to say that they they are getting at stuff that happened. <laughs> and then there might be lots of disagreement about whether the sort of ways that we make up historical theories out of historical material or the theories that we posit based on um, ethnographic work or anthropology can be realist. But at least there is an inc a sort of um, intuition that there is some realist uh, empirical foundation of, of what we're doing now. So, so there's a big discussion within anthropology of how, how realist, um, thank you, Kan, Kan Su. Uh, so there's a, like how realist do we, do we take the situations to be? Can we actually claim that the descriptions we made of the situation is what actually happened or uh, are the descriptions always interpretations and so on. And, and there's a lot of different positions of that in anthropology. I don't think I need to position myself uh, in this uh, debate. Um, and, I, and I don't think uh, Hestrop is positioning herself either. She's just saying that there is the, the inclination that you want to be true to the empirical stuff that you're engaging with. And yeah, I hope that was a sort of answer. Uh, so let's keep moving. We've got some other questions here. Uh, next, we have uh, Yoshi. Yoshi, please, you should be able to talk now. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm just curious, at the beginning of your talk, you said uh, you decided to not to include a case uh, for the sake of time. And yeah, I, I'm interested in uh, hearing basically how uh, the ideas you have discussed in the presentation uh, are instanti instantiated or yeah, like how how it works in a uh, like specific case. Uh, I understand like uh, explaining in detail would be impossible, uh, but yeah, uh, if I can hear something about, yeah. Okay. Um, so I can I can give an example of the project that I'm I'm doing right now, which um, is about the role of classification or the role of classificatory systems in clinical reasoning. So the original project was uh, founded in the fieldwork that I did during my um, my PhD, where I, I sort of got the sense that. Um, you know, classifying bodies is a bit of a, an issue sometimes, and bodies are different in all kinds of ways and show all kinds of different uh, symptoms. And sometimes they don't fit into boxes and so on. And 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 the the idea was that probably there would be some iterative practices. So I, I came to Cambridge to work with uh, Hezek Cheng on his notion of uh, epistemic iterant, uh, sorry, epistemic iteration. Um, and then I went out into the field and did two months of uh, field work in a hospital where they were following doctors around classifying patients. And um, it turned out that there was very little iteration. Um, actually, it turned out that uh, doctors often gave classifications that they weren't particularly, uh, let's say, sure of, but they were good enough um so they were true enough let's say uh and so the whole project changed and now uh the focus of the project is uh modeling and analogical reasoning 
uh, and this was came very much out of sort of the fieldwork and trying to make sense of why doctors didn't care about getting it right, um, which was very puzzling to me. But then uh, when you think about uh, um, classification systems as models, it starts to make more sense and you can you can say something meaningful about the case study. Yeah, I, I don't know if that, yeah. Thank you, that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, let's go. We've got a question in the uh, Q&A uh, from Sam Fletcher. What are the relative advantages and disadvantages of ethnography as a qualitative empirical method versus others, such as interviews or historical and textual methods? Um, right. So I think I, I hope I've already highlighted some of the advantages and Karen Sue also um, emphasized this notion of the body as a research tool and the sort of embeddedness and the the way in which ethnography allows you to not just rely on things that people can account for in words or that people actually are able to account. So one thing is things that are nonverbal, but also even just things that aren't present to people or they have a misconception of what they're actually doing or they have a different verbal conception from a, from the practical conception. Um, so I don't, um, I think interviews can do some things, ethnography can do other things. Typically, uh, ethnography is a lot more demanding, I would say. So ethnography really requires that you take yourself and your life into an, another uh, field and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. Um, and there's a lot of um, uncertainty and navigation involved. Um, so that's a sort of practical downside. Um, yeah, I don't know, like if you, if you want to find out a, about people's illness narratives, for example, maybe interviews might be more uh, obvious to go with. Uh, whereas if you want to find out about uh, ways that um, uh, people react to, this was my uh, PhD project, was way, ways that doctors responded to disgust. Um, ethnography turned out to be <laughs> where, where I had to go to to um, to get some some sort of insight in this. So so yeah. It very much depends on what is the interest of the of the project and and what does the method give you access to. Okay, we've got another question um, from uh, with a raised hand here from Vincenzo. Vincenzo, you should be able to unmute and talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, hi, uh, I'm Vincenzo. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I got a question about your view on the future of ethnographic philosophy or about the future of the you in general, the, the general use of qualitative methods for philosophical purposes, because um, we, that we are in the field of employing uh, um, qualitative methods for philosophical purposes, uh, we often uh, draw a parallel with um, what is going on with the history and philosophy of science. You know? uh, if the use of case studies in HPS is not a problem, uh, it shouldn't be a problem also for ethnographic philosophy. But uh, HPS uh, has become its own discipline. It has created a sort of a, a paradigm in which uh, different philosophers uh, often discuss. Uh, so there is a common language and philosophers uh, engaged in HPS uh, often discuss a handful of uh, historical case studies uh, to assess uh, received uh, philosophical uh, um, views. For instance, uh, uh, are there scientific revolutions or not? And to which extent there was uh, this kind of change in the chemical revolution or not? Uh, as it is now, qualitative philosophy of science or ethnographic philosophy of science looks more like a constant production of new case studies, but with little synthesis and little conversation even among the philosophers who are constructing these case studies. So 
in a sense, in order for having such a conversation, the ethnographic philosophy of science should be able to construct uh, its own uh, philosophical concepts as HPS has done with the concepts of uh, revolution, incommensurability, pluralism in the history of science and so on and so forth. Which kind of philosophical concepts do you think that ethnographic philosophy uh, can actually uh, develop in order to unify the subfield? Or do you think that by its own nature, the field has to remain uh, disunified at risk of a sort of even kind of a um, solipsistic uh, um, research, like uh, each ethnographic philosopher just go on the field and she or he does their own thing uh, without talking uh, <laughs> uh, to other ethnographic philosophers because they have got not much to talk about, if not just the method. Thanks. Um, so um, oh, uh, I, th I think I would, I've been thinking more about uh, ethnographic philosophy in parallel with, so I actually, I'm in an HPS department and I've, I think that there are many ways in which I can discuss my work with my colleagues, even though they're working with integrated HPS and I'm working with, with qualitative studies. But what I've been thinking about is more the experiment, like x phi, so experimental philosophy, where people have come together, not necessarily there's been some different like interest in ethical questions, interest in in language questions and so on. But but what they've come together around is really talking about the method and what it is that the method can do. And I think before we can start, I guess for HPS it was the other way around, but I really think we need to have this conversation about what we're what we're thinking on the method and, and how we're using it. Um, and how we're going to implement it, say, for example, have method uh, sections in our papers and so on uh, before we can can do much else. And I think that's the, the first step I see. Now, I think also I want to say that history is a bit different from ethnography because history, you can do historical case studies of the same cases over and over again. You can find slightly new material that will be available to other historians. Um, you can sort of work over time to expand and reinterpret historical case studies. The same is not the case for ethnography insofar as you really take it seriously that the body is the tool. Um, it can't be the, there's no sense in which you and I could do the same case study. Um, so, so, so this idea that we should synthesize case studies, maybe we want to to study similar things in different contexts. I don't know, um, but I, I think I shouldn't, I don't have any, I don't feel like I'm the one who should be positing the current, the common themes that would emerge. I think that has to happen just naturally. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thank you, Vincenzo. Um, I want to move to one last brief question before we uh, close, and um, and that is uh, came in through the Q and A panel. Um, it's a little bit more of a comment. I'm going to rephrase it as a question. Um, so, in health sciences, uh, evolving practice includes the concept of a reflective practitioner. Um, if we consider the purpose of research uh, to be distinguished by things like basic versus applied versus action, um, is it uh, uniquely the case or specially the case that applied research requires reflection, say, to drive uh, theory development? Or is it something that uh, maybe we would expect um, in uh, other categories as well? So sorry, is the question whether we might expect an interest in empirical knowledge? Well, so I think I think it's the reflexivity in the context of this, the activity itself. So um, uh, the astro astronomers don't seem to have a burden to be reflective practitioners mm. in, in, in the same way that maybe a uh, um, doctor might or something like that. Right. So, uh, okay. Well, 
I mean, to be honest, I don't think people are very worried about philosophers getting it wrong. Um, they should be, but I don't think they are. So in that sense, if if the argument holds, no one would would care about philosophers being reflective. I don't think that's necessarily why, well, it might be in some cases that we really want people to be reflective is there's a lot at stake, but I don't think that's why it necessarily uh, comes about. So I was discussing this with a colleague recently who's working on, on historical methods and pointing out that also in, in often in, in history, there aren't, um, there are, the the method sections are more about how you found your sources and what sources were available than they are about your own positionality related to the sources. Um, so so I think reflexivity comes out of experiencing your own effect on. So again, returning to the idea that history very much relies on sources that are permanent somehow it can be passed from one researcher to another. Uh, whereas that's not the case for ethnography, and it's also not the case for medicine. Uh, you really uh, sort of realize that you as a person has quite a lot of impact on how things unfold. Um, so I would stipulate, and this is completely anecdotal, I think, or, or at least my best my best guess, but without a lot of, of evidence backing it, that reflexivity usually arises in disciplines where you are confronted with your own effect on the things that you're uh, trying to get knowledge about. And so as soon as we start doing ethnography, uh, you'll very quickly become aware of, of the many ways in which, for example, for me being a woman, being of a certain age, uh, speaking a certain language and so on, gives me access to uh, particular venues and not to others, uh, invitations to particular things and not to others. Um, and so you you just very naturally start to realize that um, that that is a part of of your investigation. Okay, thank you very much for those answers, and thank you again for a great presentation. And thank you, Karen Sue, for your commentary, and to everybody for the questions and listening. Uh, we appreciate it and are glad to have you. Um, this closes the installments of the postdoc forum for 2023. We'll be back in the spring of 2024 with a few new installments. Please join us then. You can always find more information at the website of the Minnesota Center uh, for Philosophy of Science. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, take care. We'll see you soon.